our today's UHW podcast. This is our very first podcast, and today we'll be discussing the difference of being in the union. And with me today, I have two lovely guests. I have Tamaya and I have Marissa. My name is Tamaya Andrews. I work in Fremont Kaiser Medical Center. I'm a medical assistant, and I've been with Kaiser for over seven years. And my name is Marissa. I'm uh, from Kaiser Antioch, and I've been with Kaiser for about six years, also in the medicine department. So we're here today discussing union difference in healthcare. Tamai, let's start with you. What brings you to healthcare? Um, so when I had my children, um, that was the first time they were born with medical um, issues, and so through that process, I had to learn how to care for them, how to be an advocate. And so um, I also share my experiences with others as well and help them navigate through that process too. So that after a while I went to school um, to become a medical assistant. For me, it was more like um, I grew up in a family of six. My mom was a single mother. And so um, we grew up very um, like involved in the community um, my mom would like take us to summer camps and stuff like that so um, it truly felt like the saying where it takes a village hit home for us and so um, had it not been for our community um, I think that you know our family would be in a very different place right now and so I think that that drove me to have a passion for like helping others and caring for others and giving back to my community as well and so I just saw healthcare as another venue for me to um, explore that and you know be the advocate for others that you know maybe when I was younger you know I had people that were advocating for me so while you are in this non-union health health care position right did management have times where they would give you additional tasks or things that you had to do that was maybe outside the scope of your job duties um, that you initially came on board for Yes, the workload was heavy and anything that they came up with we okay. um, to add to our work duties daily we had to do because okay. it was like you either do it or you your your goal. Um, we didn't have that support of the union. We didn't have that contract or anything like that. So mm. whatever it was told for you to do, you do. Uh, definitely. I worked at a pediatrician's office at that time and um, I was responsible for doing check-in and front office, um, but at the time, um, since they were noticing that I, you know, was very efficient and I was finishing my work, you know, pretty on time and like early and, and you know, still had time to maybe take care of other things, um, there were times where I would ask, be asked to do medical records to process them to get them out of the pa uh, out to the patients, um, and then in addition to that, uh, there were parents that. We had a lot of patients that were Spanish speaking. And so in addition to that, I had to actually translate all our forms that we had there at work for patients to like new patient information. So I translated all of those. And additionally, when the doctor would see the patient and the medical assistant, a lot of them didn't speak Spanish. So then they would pull me into the rooms to translate um, for the parents and the patients to make sure that they got the information they needed. Okay. And for me, when I first came on board at Kaiser Permanente, I came in the sales capacity, so it was a non-union position. And things, I must tell you, is quite different from a union position. Um, there, I was asked to do a lot of things. The hours a little bit longer. Um, and so I was kind of like Tamaya, I was asked to do things um, on a continuous basis because I just couldn't say no at the time because of the position that I was in. Were you, either one of you able to speak up on issues that you were uncomfortable with that management seems to have placed upon you? When, yes, I was um, very vocal and at times I had to be careful though. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, it wasn't to, um, make a problem or anything but it was just to kind of make it better you know for me my co-workers and the patients right because if we're not um up to par or if we're drained mm -hmm. then we can't provide the care that's needed to the patients so yes i did speak it up okay good for you and you Marissa? um for me it was a little bit different um i like i said before i was just grateful to have a job and so you know, when I was asked to do something, I would just kind of do it. 
um, and if it became too much, um, then I didn't feel that it was a safe space for me to speak up okay. because then it was like, okay, well, if you can't get the work done, then maybe we need to hire someone else. Right. And so, you know, then it went into like job security. And so um, at that time, I just kind of would keep my head down, do my job. Um, but there were a couple of times that I was called into the manager's office, of, you know, over making uh, mistakes here and there. Okay. Um, but obviously I was doing the job of like three people, so it was inevitable. Um, but yeah, as far as me being able to speak up, unfortunately, no, I would just kind of do what was asked of me. So it was not a speak up environment. No. Okay. And for you both, while you were in that environment, right, um, and you had things that were going on that you weren't comfortable with, right, were there times, and can you share a story with me, um, that you spoke up? You let management know how you feel, either one of you. Um, yeah, my aunt passed away, um, and they were not trying to give me bereavement because, of course, we don't have a contract. We don't have anything that has language that they have to let me off. Um, and I really needed to speak to my, manage my manager in regards to that because that was close to home for me. That was, you know, she, she was like my best friend. This is someone I talk to daily. Um, and for me not to be a part of um, her service or even have that grieving time was hard. So um, it was almost like they wanted to give me a choice. Like, you know, okay, are you calling out sick? Are you coming in? You know, we can give you the day for the service, but it's like, no, wow. you know, so, yeah. Um, and for me, um, after I'd been working there for a while, I was actually able to get my sister a job there as well. Um, and so I remember there was a time where she did speak up. She, you know, mm -hmm. she's a little bit more uh, vocal than I am, um, right. you know, back then. Right. And so she spoke up about a lot of the workload that she was taking on and it just became too much. And um, she tried to get one of the other employees to like help her out and they weren't willing to. So then it got into like a heated argument. Um, wow. It came, you know, to the manager finding out about it. And the manager just basically came to the office, you know, asked her for her keys and told her that she was fired right then and there. And so wow. that was just very, it was a very uh, like vivid memory for me because I remember that there were instances where I felt the same way, like the job load was too much and it just confirmed for me that I wasn't able to speak up because if I did speak up then, you know, my job could be next. And so I recall in that situation when the other employee spoke up and, you know, basically blamed her for something, um, my sister said, you know, you know, it's not true. I was willing to help her, but I also need help because, you know, my job load is becoming too much. But there was no steps of investigation. There was no disciplinary, like, um, action followed, um, you know, no warning given. Um, basically, the manager just ended up coming in and asking her for her keys and telling her that she was fired. And so that hit home for me and it was very vivid because I too felt that the job load was becoming too much and had I spoke up, you know, my job would have been next. Wow. That's, yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely not an environment that was conducive to speaking up. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely not. Um, so while you're dealing with that, um, what, what was the pay like? What, what type of compensation were you receiving at that time, Tamaya? Um, so the pay was low. Um, you know, it was hard to keep up with the cost of living. Okay. Um, we also had to pay for our benefits. And me having children with disabilities or needs, um, I had to get medical. So it was hard for me and my husband um, because they would only cover either him or me mm -hmm. on our job. Um, was at times that I had to pick and choose which benefit we're going to take this year. Is it going to do the dental? We're going to do the vision? Because we were paying so much out, it was like we were barely bringing anything home. So it was a struggle, um, especially, um, you know, with the benefit part. We had to pay at least two, three hundred dollars per person. That was just for the medical part of it. Um, so it was, we were spending at least almost close to $1,000 just for benefits. Wow. We're a family of five. Um, for me, I mean, it was similar. Um, I wasn't making, making very much. I started out making $16 an hour and um, 
towards the end of the time that I was there, I was making 19. Um, but again, I was a single parent, uh, but I also needed to make sure that I had medical benefits for my son and I. So it was $300 for me and $300 for my son. So right off the bat, it was $600 grown from my paycheck, you know, that I could have used for like childcare, you know, food, groceries, gas. So there were times that I had to make that choice, like, you know, um, I need to save this money for gas, so I'm maybe not going to spend so much on groceries. Um, and I recall that there were times, although I was a full-time working parent and I was working in healthcare, that I found myself like going to food banks, like you know, asking for help because it was so mm -hmm. hard to survive off, you know, such a low wage. Yeah. Um, so we had to pick and choose what benefits that we were going to pay. Um, you know for that enrollment time um and so my my sons needed glasses that was for sure they needed glasses you know they had um two eye surgeries each um so they needed glasses at a very young age and so we had to pay for glasses this is something that they needed daily and we had to wait on the dental process so you know through that process we all it, it made us you know they cavities and teeth cleaning and those type of things are like okay which one do we choose um so those were hard times and hard choices to make similar to, to maya there were times when you know my son's well visit was coming up or you know he needed to go to the dentist like although i had medical coverage like i still had deductibles that i had to pay or out of pockets and so I would have to plan that out and start saving towards that because otherwise, you know, and at that time he was young, he was like three, four years old, so he needed to go to his well bases, you know, he had shots that he needed to get and so, um, you know, I had to plan for that and I had to budget and put that into my budget uh, because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to receive the care that although I was paying for medical coverage I was almost like afraid to use it because it's like am I gonna be able to afford the out-of-pockets and the deductibles you know is it something that can wait like Tamaya was saying um, for a while you know he didn't go to the dentist either um, and I know that for myself like I didn't even get dental or vision it was just medical <laughs> Um, so it was just sad to see that although I was working in healthcare and I had medical coverage, I wasn't feeling comfortable enough to be able to use it because I couldn't afford it. All right. And I can say it was like we made, we hit that mark or just a little bit over that mark where you can get assistance, you know, right. state funded assistance or anything like that. It was just like, okay, you're working. So you don't qualify for this or you don't qualify for this assistance. So that was really hard. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, okay, well, should I quit my job and you guys going to help me take care of my kids or do I go to work and, you know, deal with this struggle? Right. Yeah. That really hit so. home for me because I remember there was a time where when I did start working there, you know, I was getting assistance with helping pay for childcare. Mm -hmm. And I remember as I started getting my raises, I was getting excited. I'm like, okay, you know, now I'm going to be able to <laughs> save a little bit. But then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, I remember they were, um, requalifying me for the next year and they said oh you know what you make too much now so we yeah. can't help you i literally went over by 50 dollars a year oh. mm -hmm. and so at that point it was like okay so now i have to pay for child child care so that was another added on you know expense that i was not able to afford you know i had to try to maneuver you know expenses what am i gonna pay for in order to be able to take care of all that Right. Well, I can understand. I mean, I can also recall when I first came on board because Permanente was uh, in a non-union capacity, and I recall that um, I had to pay for my health only health care, and for my family it was roughly I think I was paying maybe nine hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. right? And then when it came to vision, I had to select um, uh, I believe it was Vision Essential or something of the sort, which was. Uh, it wasn't just as a, a complete package. So I actually had to pick and choose a package. Uh, but as you pick and choose the packages, prices start going up, right? Mm -hmm. So you start saying, well, hey, if I brush my teeth correctly, I may not need dental. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I use a magnifying glass or I go to store my <laughs> glasses from from the, uh, the, uh, the grocery store there, then I won't need uh, vision care. So I can relate. I can relate that you had to pick and choose your benefits and the hardships that you both went through during that time. Yeah. 
So I'm sorry that you had to deal with that, but this is what happens when you're in a non-unit environment. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was the breaking point? What made you want to make the move from a non-unit environment to a union environment? And that union environment is at Kaiser Permanente. What was that breaking point? What did it look like to either one of you? The very um, last straw was one time when I went in to see my manager for my annual review and she had told me like you know you're a great asset to the um, office you know you're doing great thank you for all the hard work you do you're um, we appreciate your job um, however we can't afford to give you a raise this year and so I felt like that right there just told me okay it's time for me to move on and start looking somewhere else because you know, I was making uh, I was making all those hard sacrifices and hard decisions. Well, me growing up, Kaiser was always my dream job. <laughs> I don't know. Um, just knowing that people that worked at Kaiser, they always said it was hard to get into Kaiser, but I know people that was in Kaiser for many, many years. It just seemed like it was stability. It was growth. It was um, protected. And so even going through school, I was like, I'm, I'm going to be working at Kaiser. That's where I'm going. So I was building up to get to Kaiser. Wow. Yeah. Um, my my story, more or less, is that I ran into a college buddy of mine that we played ball together, and he he said to me, "Hey, you know, you need to come on over to Kaiser." And I'm like, "Well, you know, I'm keeping my options open, right?" Because <laughs> back then, and Kaiser had a whole another name to it. Um, so he invited me, he was a hiring manager, so I got on board, no problem, but I got on board on the non-union side of the house, right? And I explained to you the, the, how much the higher benefits are, right? You know, you could pay out way more, you gotta choose between dental, vision, and all that other stuff. Then I have a friend of mine that's, um, that works in a facility that's on the union side of the house, right? And I wasn't aware that the benefits were a whole lot better, right, right. on the union side. so. I made that transition, and I must say that was a great transition, still within the same company, but it's, it's like night and day when you go from a non-union environment to a, a union environment. So for me, I made that transition. I'm happy where I am. The benefits are wonderful. Now I don't have to pay $900 a month. I don't have to choose between <laughs> dental or vision. I, I am able to get, get it all. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and that was for me, but a lot of that I didn't learn until I got to Kaiser. Okay. I didn't learn about the union portion of it until I came into Kaiser. And I was like, oh, I have rights. Oh, we have a contract. They have to give me this or we have to abide by this. That, that was totally different for me. And I learned all that coming into Kaiser. Um, I was very grateful I didn't have to pay for our benefits and knowing that our my whole family is covered and right. from vision to dental to 401k to pension to all of these things I didn't have a clue um, um, because we didn't have this at the, the other job mm -hmm. so it was it was it was like I like I, I, I won when I came to Kaiser that's how I felt right so yeah well for me it was a little bit different I started on call and so for me it was mainly like the pay like you know it was a, a step up in wages and um i went from making 19 dollars an hour to making 25 so i'm like you know this is awesome like i'm able to feel like uh comfortable uh where i'm in a comfortable space financially where i can support my son um i didn't know about the benefits because again i was on call um, until I started hearing like my coworkers talking about like, oh, you know, like I remember one time they called me in for a shift and they said, oh, you know what, we scheduled you on accident. Like, um, we're not going to need you after all, so you can go back home. And so at that time, you know, I was living in Antioch and working in Pinole, so I had driven like over 45 minutes to get to work. Mm -hmm. And so one of my coworkers kind of like pulled me aside and said, you know, did you know that, you know, because we're part of the union, if they call you in and you show up to work, they're supposed to pay you for at least four hours of your work. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I'm coming in with um, afraid to speak up. Like, you know, I'm still like in the mode of my last job. So I'm like, okay, uh, thanks for that. But I didn't really follow through. Um, but after that, I was on call for a year and then I went to the call center. And when I was at the call center, I had a rep who was part of our team that was very good about sharing information and she was always you know wanting to get us uh, involved more in the union and that's where i got my benefits finally so 
it was definitely a blessing and like you were saying it was night and day you know I didn't have to pay six hundred dollars anymore or be afraid that I make eat too much and not qualify you know for assistance so I was able to have that burden lifted off um, of my shoulders and be able to you know focus on okay I'm gonna go to work you know I'm gonna be able to provide for me and my son right so it was definitely um, a burden lifted off my shoulders I noticed you, you, you stated that um, you had a union leader, uh, a steward, that um, enlightened you on all the benefits and all your rights and everything else. Would you say that is what prompted you to become a leader, a union leader? Yes, uh, because when I had first started as on call, um, I was part of a different um, union and I didn't really get much information, um, or I, I didn't take the time to read my book. I didn't know there was a book. I didn't know there was a contract. I didn't know there was, like Tamaya was saying earlier, like rules that needed to be abided by or followed. And so when I had my rep at the call center, like there were times during our um, team meetings that she would sit down and like let us know, like this is what's happening. You know, if you guys have any questions, this is a book. And so her example was definitely something that. Um, prompt me to become that leader just because like I said before you know I've always wanted to like be there for others and care for others so that was like a way of me advocating for like my brothers and sisters um, to have that information that maybe I didn't have when I first started yeah it was like well, I started at one facility um, where I had a steward that would like she said educate us keep mm -hmm. us informed um, and when I transitioned to another facility, it was like, no, we can't do this, we can't do that. The union contract says that, and it was just conflicting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, they they don't know the contract, or people are not educated in regards to the contract over here. And so I know someone helped me through that process, and so that's what prompted me to be a steward to help other people to learn the contract, to make sure um, we help hold management accountable for right. to the contract. Okay. You know, so that's what made me do it. And. If I can share my story too, what prompted me to become a union leader is that my sheer ignorance of everything at, in the beginning. I was not aware that there were two contracts. I was not aware that there was a national agreement. I heard of the Purple Book, but never saw it and never opened it. Um, I guess I was of the mindset that in here, right? Just give me what you're going to give me and, and I'm happy with it. But I must say that over the course of uh, few years um, I was approached and um, I've seen some of the union leaders operate and like coming from a non-union environment and seeing that hey you know these um, agreements were written placed in this book so we can all abide by where labor and management came together and said signed off on it and said yes these are going to be the working conditions and then realize that there are things that you can actually fall back on i mean it's so important that even um simple as simple as discipline coming from a non-environment and non-union environment if you get discipline right they, you know, it's at, at will, right? So if you mess up, you're out of there, right? right. There are no stages, no, no, right? There right. is no progressive discipline, mm -hmm. right? So for me, realizing that, that it's just not, you know, cut and dry and you're out of here, you know, there's actually a process, right? right. And so understand that there is a process to say, hey, I want to be a, a, a steward, as it's stated, right? I want to be able to uphold that process, the agreement to make sure that management is in line with labor and making sure things are fair and equitable, right? Right. Yeah. I can honestly say I did have one manager that was really pushing me to be a steward, too. She, she felt that I should become in that leadership role. <laughs> So I kind of pushed back for a while, but eventually, here I am, I did do it. I can say that. So now that you both are union leaders, what advice would you give to a new employee who's coming on board for the very first time being in the union job? What would you say? Learn your contract. Pick up your book um, because you don't want to miss out on anything um, that you deserve, that you're supposed to have. Um, it, it, it's so much in there um, that will be beneficial to you. So I would say learn the contract. That's the part. 
that a lot of people lack is learning the country. Learning the country. And you, Marissa? Um, I would say also, like, make sure you're educated on what your rights are, you know, the contract, mm -hmm. what, um, you know, benefits it offers you, but also staying engaged. Like, if there's CREs, make sure you attend them. If, you know, somebody from the union comes to your department, make sure you're asking questions. Like, that's how I got started. I, I got even more involved. Like, um, Tamaya was saying, at first, I didn't see myself as a leader. And at our last um, bargaining, I just wanted to know what was happening for me because right. I want to know how that's going to affect me and my family. And so, you know, I was asking questions anytime she would come around, you know, like what's happening? Are we bargaining our benefits yet? Like, when are we striking? Like all of that. I wanted to know for me so I could be prepared. And that's when she prompted me like, you know, you should think about becoming a leader. And again, I didn't see myself that way. So it took a little bit mm -hmm. of time for me to actually, um, be convinced and do it but um yeah i would say definitely stay engaged uh find someone that you trust that you're able to that's been there for maybe a little longer that you're able to ask questions to mm -hmm. or a steward and yeah definitely attend the events i know that now we get text messages make sure you read those emails just stay engaged and i agree with you both you know learning your contracts right both of them mm -hmm. the national agreement right understanding that and it drives everything else um, mm -hmm. that's in working with the coalition and then your local agreement right your collective bargain agreement that purple book having both of those and now you can do it online you right you can download it on your phone or um, PC laptop but to have those in that occasion be able to open it up and just look at it at your free time the different sections that are within there so it talks about the categorization uh, classifications rights um, disciplines so these are things that you know I would tell them to get familiar with and also the very important thing is to stay engaged just like you stated stay engaged ask questions, participate, right? Um, and find out who your leaders are, right? And uh, if nothing else, the union is all of us, right? right? So participation, active participation is always welcome. Right, because it's even to the smallest part because um, everybody kept saying seniority. That was a word that was being thrown around when I first got, what is a seniority situation? Right. Like, you know, I was small on the totem pole, so it was, it was like, okay. But all the way to vacation or just everything, you know. So, the learning the contract is, is it holds value to your employment status. Your absolutely. You know. Yeah, and just to go back to what like Garfield was saying that you know we are leaders and we've decided to take that step. But at the end of the day, we're all a union. So the more that we all know the contract, the better we can help uphold it. You know because we're all. Um, I guess I would say maybe responsible is like too much of a word, but like, you know, we're all responsible for making sure that we are educated and we know what's in that contract in the case that it ever affects us or anyone that we know that we're able to speak up and uphold it. There is so much happening that you both as union leaders, right? We're, are, we're all union leaders and we're all in a fight, right? Um, that fight we're now at, we're post COVID and we're now in bargaining. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as both of you as well as myself are, are on the bargaining team, your experiences, Marissa, um, being a bargaining team member. So I feel like this being the first bargaining session post COVID and after everything we went through the pandemic, um, I feel like, um, you know, it's extremely important for us to, uh, fight for you know a wage increase that can meet the cost of living and inflation mm -hmm. uh, because I think that right now is going to be a critical bargaining session because we're not going to settle for whatever we settled for in the past and for me it was really important to be part of the bargaining team because I want to make sure that uh, whatever agreement we settle on you know obviously that's gonna not only affect my brothers and sisters but it's gonna affect me the right. same contract that we agreed with 
uh, for all of us, it's going to affect all of us. You know, we all have some skin in it. It's not going to be, you know, that I'm agreeing to a contract for, you know, the, our members or our brothers and sisters. Like, it's going to affect me personally. Well, to piggyback off what Marissa said, that's correct. We want to make sure that we're fighting for what we deserve. Um, and it's also a learning curve as well to learn that you'll be able to take the information that we learn in these bargaining sessions or the information that is provided to us to share with our members. So I don't want us to be lost or our facilities to be lost or, you know, our brothers and sisters to be lost. We want to make sure that we keep them informed, encouraged and um, through this process as well. All right. So All right. being part of the bargaining team is for me is to make sure that we're all part of the bargaining team. Yes, this contract um, affects all of us. Not just me and you with the bargaining team, but all of us as a coalition. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody supports each other. Um, just because I'm sitting at the table, mm -hmm. you know, mean that I don't need the support from the ones that's not. Okay. Because when I come back and um, inform you guys, or you know, our members. I need that support so we can make sure that we fight together because our strength is in numbers, right? So we need to make sure that make sure that we stay united. So yeah. it's very important that we support one another. Yeah. And in addition to like to go off what you were saying is that, you know, like this is n not like any of other bargaining session that we've had in the past mm -hmm. where, you know, we are going to be fighting for um, you know, significant wage increases. It's not going to be like anything that we've fought for before. We're not going to settle for what we've settled for in the past, but it's also going to take us staying united. And if we do need to strike, it's going to take us being united and being on the same page mm -hmm. as far as, you know, when we go on strike, sending that message to the employer that we're not going to settle for less than what we deserve. Right. As, as bargaining team members, which we all are, we want everyone else to be involved, right? We try mm -hmm. to get all the bargaining updates. We need everyone to be involved, knowledgeable, participate, right? We want, this is not only for us, it's for all of us, right? The union is just, it's, when we say union, it's all of us, mm -hmm. right? And just like Tamaya said about strength in numbers, mean that we, once again, I, 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 I can't say it um, anymore that we all are stakeholders. We all have an investment mm -hmm. in what becomes of our bargaining. Right. Yes. Yes. So. And I know like we've, you know, seen sometimes comments about like, you know, I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that. But I think right now is the time for us to look at the bigger picture and you know keep that in, in the forefront of our mind you know like anything like Dave was saying earlier there could always be improvements made you know but um, at the same time like we want to hear from the members we want our brothers and sisters to stay involved so that way if something is happening or need a uh, concern needs to be brought up that you know our brothers and sisters are communicating with us and we're you know in turn sharing that information that is mm -hmm. being brought up at bargaining with them right this is an entirely democratic process right we're all engaged we're all participating right we just happen to have a seat at the table mm -hmm. but you know let everyone else know that we will definitely get the information out there their voices are also being heard mm -hmm. would you agree with yes yeah. we're all at the table mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay nobody could have thought that we were going to go through what we went through during the pandemic and you know, I feel like our generation is unique in the fact that we were mm -hmm. we went through that and we were able to come out mm -hmm. at the other side of it. And, you know, unfortunately, we did lose a lot of people along the way, but we also can do better. And now we can, you know, fight for those things that maybe we thought we didn't need that now we know we deserve. Yes. So we have to make sure that we, you know, remember how this started, how the union started how our ancestors how it was other people that fought for contracts for us to be here so we have to make sure that we pave the way for others you know our grandchildren our children the people that's going to be taking care of us we want to make sure that they feel like they're supported that they get what they deserve so we need to make sure we stand united united for all united for all united for all but yeah Oh, look, there's Dave. Hey, Dave. Hi. <laughs> Come on in. 
we're just here, you know, um, having conversation about like the union difference and um, we all, both Tamaya and I came from a non-union job and so did Garfield. So we're sharing like a little bit more about ex our experience, but yeah, have a seat. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't know you guys were up here. We have a special guest in front of us here. We have Mr. Dave Reagan. Reagan, would you like to <laughs> introduce yourself? Sure, Garfield. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dave Reagan. I'm the president of UHW, and I just stumbled across these digital podcasting professionals and wandered into this. So I'm I'm happy I'm happy to be here and happy to join in in any way that makes sense. So what are you doing here, Garfield? So what we're doing here today, we're talking about union differences. Um, with our previous guest, we were um, talking about what it makes to have a difference in being coming from a non-union to a union environment. But also we have with us is Faye Eastman. Faye, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Faye Eastman. I'm from Oakland Kaiser. Been there about 14 years. Thank you. Welcome, Faye. Welcome. So we, we are continuing the conversation on the union difference, right? And Faye, you could just real quickly give us uh, mm -hmm. some experience with what, what it's the difference like from you coming from a non-union environment to a union environment. Well, before I worked at Kaiser, I worked in a skilled nursing facility, even though it was still a union. It was still SEIU 250 at the time, but it was like such a big difference from being in a union, being <laughs> in the union at Kaiser. It just seemed like maybe they're more organized there. Maybe, I'm not quite sure. But when I was in um, skilled nursing, one of the situations that really uh, resonated with me that I remember vividly to this day is um, I'd worked there three years and I worked night shift. So I would read the contract at night that I had um, from the union and I'd read the contract that I had from the company, right? And so in the company contract, it says you get a raise after your first year and you get an additional raise after your third year. But I noticed that was not reflecting on my checks. And so, you know, I spoke to the manager at the time and I was like, yeah, I don't see the, the by then it was three years. So I, like, I didn't see the annual raise and I didn't speak up at the one year because I was like new to working in a union. I wasn't quite sure like the waters I could tread, like, <laughs> so I was kind of tippy toeing, right? And so then by three year, I'm like, look, I know I'm supposed to have that raise. Like, I've read the contract. Why are we playing these games? So I went to HR and the HR person at the time, she, you know, agreed with the manager. Oh no, talk to your union, go back to your union. I'm like, but I'm reading the contract that you guys literally wrote. Like, I could read. Like, it says I'm supposed to get a raise year and three year. And so that HR person left. And like, I think like six months later, I said, well, let me go talk to the new HR person. So I sat down with that HR person and she, you know, looked at the paperwork I showed her and she was like, you know what, you're right. We are supposed to give you an annual raise in a three years. So we'll go ahead and back pay you. So when they back paid me, I got like almost $3,000 in back pay, which was like amazing working at Skilled when I was only making like $14, $15 an hour. That made a huge difference for me to get that back pay. And then of course my coworkers, they were like, oh, how did you do that? <laughs> So I helped them do the paperwork <laughs> so all the coworkers get their annual and three year and then it was a five year. There were some people that were supposed to get a five year raise and they were able to get that. And then oddly enough when people would have issues there like and they had to meet with management, they would ask like, oh Faye, can you come with me? I have to go talk to the manager. And I thought it was just because like some of the people there had language barriers. I was like, maybe they just want someone to explain things or something, right? Like. And management HR, they thought, they said, well, aren't you a steward? And I was like, no, not technically. But the union got whiff of it real quick, and they heard it put me in steward training. And that's literally how I became a steward. <laughs> <laughs> I was, like, already doing the work. I just didn't know, like, it was a whole process of becoming a steward. So I was already doing the work just to help people, but then I became, like, official steward. So I, I was glad that I was persistent about it. But like I said, I was still worried because I was like, oh, they might fire me for trying to like, you know, put waves in the ocean, you know, but I still took that chance and I'm glad I did. No, I, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk about even the difference between the union at Kaiser versus the union at a single nursing home, mm -hmm. you know, and then you could compare that to a non-union facility. But I think for a lot of our members at Kaiser, it's easy to forget because this is just our daily lived experience that this is a big organization mm -hmm. and you know one of the things people may or may not realize there's three major sets of 
contract negotiations in America going on this summer. The largest is between the Teamsters and UPS. And that contract covers over 300,000 people. It's going to expire at the end of the summer. That's actually the largest contract in America. The third largest is between the auto workers, General Motors, Ford, and what used to be Chrysler, different name now, um, and that covers about 60,000 people. And then there's our negotiations between the coalition and Kaiser. This is actually the second biggest set of contract negotiations going on anywhere in America. And, you know, because of just the size and the nature of the partnership and the nature of our union, I think there's a lot of unique features that really distinguish. And one of the things that I've talked to members a lot about, speaking of the union difference, you know, going back to the pandemic, and I think people remember that we were able to negotiate childcare benefits for UHW members. We were able to negotiate enhanced COVID benefits. We were able to negotiate housing benefits. And one of the things that I think it's important that we all remember um, is that out of our 57,000 members, over 42,000 members used at least one of those benefits. Some used all three. And the value of those was over $200 million. None of that is in the contract. That's the union difference too. And we also succeeded in getting that for everyone across Kaiser, but we negotiated that with Kaiser. And that's something 42,000 people, child care, sick leave, that's amazing. housing benefits if they didn't want to expose their families. And, you know, and that's just something that we did in the course of everything else. And, you know, all kinds of activity going on all the time. Um, and just always looking for opportunities and you know I know things there's always more to be done there's always ways to improve but I think you know that we have created something and we have a system in place where we're able to make a lot of progress and and it's up to us to make sure we communicate to people how right. those these things don't just happen uh -huh. they don't that's just true. you know there's a reason that all of that happens so. i think that's epic on top of the great contract we were able to acquire more great things that we needed during a pandemic and that's what i love about our union we're constantly um evolving you know we're not just like staying in in one place or in one zone we're constantly like, how can we make it better for this group? How can we make it better for that group? And, and that's what I love about it. I really do. Yeah. And, and if I can go back to the, the three additional benefits that we were able to acquire. Um, I'm one of that 42,000 that actually used the COVID sick leave. Right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten COVID twice, so I was able to use that. So I didn't have to use my sick leave. So I, you know, I thank everyone that participating in making this happen because it, it definitely it truly has been um, a wonderful additional benefit for me and my family. Yeah. No, and for lots and lots of people. And frankly, you know, the other thing, and, and I don't, I know people know this because you know, a little bit over half of our members work at Kaiser, the balance work in hospitals all across the state. Um, you know, because of the size of the union at Kaiser, we're able to achieve things that we try to achieve in other places, but we have more success here at Kaiser than we have at other places. And that child care benefit, you know, we were able, we did succeed in getting the COVID benefits at other uh, institutions and other employers. But that child care benefit was something we were only successful in getting done at Kaiser. And that's, you know, that if, if memory serves, I think that was something like $400 a week. And that was just a huge thing. And everybody was struggling with the realities of how do I care for my kids who aren't going to school anymore, right? That all just got dumped on people. So, you know, it's... It's good to think back about that and to learn from the past and now our job is to figure out what do we do in this set of negotiations to continue to extend the progress and make sure that we're looking for the next set of opportunities for what we can do for people. Absolutely. Um, and that, that also reminds me of um, UHW. We're all about uplifting the community. Uh, we're all about helping others. Well, part of the mission is that um, of the union in general is to make sure that the wages and benefits uh, affect all of our members. But we're also doing more so than that. What do we? What current bills that we have in place? We, can you speak on, Dave? That that we're, 
that we're working on now? Well, just this week in the state legislature, we succeeded in uh, in the state senate in getting the twenty-five dollar an hour minimum wage bill successfully voted out of the senate. It's now going to go to the California Assembly, um, and this is something you know that affects a portion of our members, particularly in Southern California. It is true that in Northern California wages are higher for a whole set of reasons than they are in Southern California on average across healthcare. Um, but this is a big deal and I think in particular at Kaiser this has a big effect on EVS workers, okay. particularly in Southern California, medical assistants, particularly in Southern California, but then healthcare workers um, generally. And uh, we you know, in another part of what we do, we recently won an election in San Diego for 1,500 people at a hospital called Sharp Grossmont. Uh, and I've been down there a few times. We're getting ready to negotiate the contract. But one of the things that was shocking, and it took about 10 minutes to learn this, is at that hospital in San Diego, there's lots of workers who live in Tijuana oh, because wow. of the cost of housing. Wow. They have to live in Tijuana because they can't afford rents in San Diego. They cross the border, some of them every day, just to be able to make their lives work. And so when we we're able to raise um, the minimum wage across the state, you know, it, it helps all kinds of people, mostly non-union people, but we do believe in this organization that you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, and we cannot, you know, you if you take the view, and sometimes in the past unions have done this, that it's got to all be just about the union members, mm -hmm. eventually you just create too much of a distance between the, the union folks and the non-union folks, and so we believe fundamentally that it's important that we act in the best interest of everybody, okay. and it's great when that helps us, but it's also important that we bring others along and continue to do all the kinds of work. But just this week, we were successful in, in the state senate. Um, you know, we people just got their checks on the staffing retention bonuses. That was something we got done in the state budget. Um, and that affected 700,000 healthcare workers and put $1.8 billion directly into people's pockets because of the work that everybody in our organization did. And, you know, it's, again, looking all the time for opportunities out there. And, and Faye, recently I heard that you um, had the ability to speak on SB 525. You told a very compelling story. Um, would you like to share that story with us? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I went to the um, California Democratic Party convention over the past weekend and that was an awesome experience. Um, I was able to go as a delegate for uh, Senator Nancy Skinner. Love her. She's amazing. She does great work. Um, and we went and we spoke out in support of SB 525. It was about 39 um, delegates from our group there and uh, we each spoke out about it. And when I went to the podium to go speak, I was like, you know, I was going to keep it like, you know, get the information out and, you know, but keep it, keep it cute, keep it cool. <laughs> but I don't know, I got to the podium and I don't know what happened. It's just like all the experiences I've had, meeting people in SoCal, making $17, $18, $19, $19 an hour, something just took over and I just like, I let them have it. I did, you know. I have expressed my experience of working in the ICU during the pandemic and how difficult that was and how healthcare workers still remain, still stayed and helped and take care of the patients. Um, I explained to them that you have people making, like I said, $17 and $19 an hour working two or three jobs. They're not able to go home and be back to work. They're like sleeping in their cars, waking up, going to another shift. Some are homeless, you know, and they leave work, go to a tent come back you know they get showers where they can you know like it's just it was so emotional but it was information i needed to know because they're not going to hear these stories unless we share them they're not going to know the average patient doesn't know how difficult we work like if you work a 16 hour shift like i can't do a 16 hour shift. i've tried and by hour 14 or 15 my brain just checks out like it's just not there so i, I don't do a whole lot of overtime like that but it, it just it was important for me to express the concern and need 
for the healthcare workers in the state of California that they deserve a livable wage. They deserve to have a roof over their head, like basic necessities. They're not like, we're not asking, like, we're not trying to make them millionaires. No, basic necessities to be able to continue to provide great health care uh, for the passion that they have for the patients, the care they have for taking care of the patients. That's important. They needed to hear that. And that's what I wanted to express that day. That's what I did. I heard you did a fantastic job in expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing I'm your story. I'm glad I could do it. Great. Thank you so much. And, you know, as you're talking about, um, how things happen, uh, progress. You know, we were in that pandemic, right, where we had uh, COVID. Um, during the tech industry, there were layoffs, right, that happened. Um, Dave, what's, what was your experience there during the, those troubling times there? Um, uh, any layoffs or attempts to lay off that, uh, that you were aware of? Let me take a half a step back. I think it's important, again, you know, we have the Earned Income Security Agreement at, at Kaiser, and it really does provide a tool and a safety net for members that even if there's a proposal mm -hmm. to eliminate jobs or ultimately lay people off, we have the right to negotiate, we have the right to make sure people land on their feet at the same you know, at the same level of pay, it's not uncommon that people actually end up in positions that pay more money when we're faced with those kinds of things, which is very different than what, you know, people in non-union settings face. But, you know, I think for us, the, the issue of layoffs, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of that. There was one visible example that we had, uh, which was actually an attempt by Kaiser to eliminate a group of PCTs uh, at um, Phase Place here in Oakland. Uh, and because we have the Earned Income Security Agreement, because we have a contract, because we have a history of you know really making sure that when we get a proposal from Kaiser to eliminate jobs, that we use every tool that we have to, to try to stop that and make sure people can maintain their wages, maintain their benefits, and in some cases actually end up in positions that, that pay more. Um, but specifically in Faye's case, there was, uh, you know, we went so far as to actually build a nursing floor in front of the national headquarters for Kaiser. We had beds out in the street, people stayed overnight. There was, you know, we were modeling what it looks like to care for as many patients as PCTs care for. We did right. a press conference, there were elected officials. It got a lot of attention and ultimately we're, we were successful. And it was something we had actually tried a few years earlier when there was an effort to eliminate the gardener positions in Northern California. And we built a garden uh, and did street theater in front of the national headquarters of Kaiser. So, you know, when those things happen and they do happen, we have different tools available to us, but we're able to make sure that people land on their feet, sometimes actually get promotions or higher level uh, paying jobs as a result of it. But the, the one that really did happen during the pandemic was the example with the PCTs in Oakland. All right. yep. That concludes our episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Don't forget that notification button. Thank <laughs> you.